One way that we can talk about or classify different kinds of polymers is based on their structure. And we've already shown that the structure of polymers can be discussed at various levels of detail. So here we're going to take a closer look uh, at some of these structural attributes of polymers. One level of structure that we've already talked about a little bit uh, is the atomic level structure. So this deals with the nature of the uh, atoms that are on the polymer chain and how they're uh, distributed on the polymer chain. So remember we talked about polyethylene and we showed this as an example of a simple polymer. It has a carbon backbone and hydrogen side groups. Contrast that to Kevlar, which remember is different because it has these rigid uh, phenylene ring groups incorporated directly on the polymer backbone. So this difference in the atomic level architecture uh, leads to differences in the properties. A polyethylene, for example, has a flexible chain, whereas Kevlar uh, has a more rigid chain that behaves almost like a rigid rod. So as a result of this behavior at the atomic level, then these polymers have very different physical properties. Polyethylene can be heated, melted, and molded into a variety of shapes whereas Kevlar actually can't be melted uh, because it would start to degrade uh, before uh, you'd reach a temperature where uh, it could melt. The molecules are so rigid, but they can be spun into fibers that have a very high mechanical strength. So as a result, um, you know, Kevlar can be used for things like bulletproof vests uh, and body armor, uh, things like that, but not necessarily molded parts. Another difference between these materials is because the chain flexibility of polyethylene uh, allows it to pack very densely and form a crystalline phase uh, in some cases. Uh, Kevlar is actually an interesting material because it's a so-called liquid crystalline. So that means that these rigid molecules, uh, as you pack more and more into the same volume, uh, thermodynamically, the only way that can continue to happen uh, to increase the concentration is for them to spontaneously align uh, in a common direction. So this, uh, they possess some degree of order, but not uh, ordering like on a lattice uh, structure. Uh, they have more of a directional order. That's what the liquid crystalline state refers to. Uh, they can also experience secondary interactions like hydrogen bonding between chains. So these are some examples of uh, the atomic level structure uh, that we can use to compare uh, these different kinds of polymers. Another level of structure is the molecular level, which deals with the architecture of the polymer chain. And the key things that I want to point out here are differences between linear chains, which is what we sort of developed as our initial picture of polymers. And again, polyethylene is a good example of this because in the high density polyethylene form, this is a linear chain where basically it's like a strand of spaghetti. Uh, you have carbons along the backbone uh, and hydrogens coming out. Low-density polyethylene is an example of a branched architecture. So there's still a primary backbone to the chain, but instead of being linear, uh, you could have uh, arms or branch points uh, where shorter uh, chain segments uh, propagate outward. So in other words, instead of a hydrogen here, you could have a carbon uh, that would uh, form like a mini backbone for another subchain. Uh, and this is low-density polyethylene. So remember when we talked about these, we said that low-density polyethylene, because of these branching points, it restricts it, the chain from being able to compact uh, densely enough to crystallize. So low-density polyethylene materials are kind of softer, have a lower mechanical strength. High-density polyethylene materials are more rigid uh, and have a higher mechanical strength. We can also talk about different uh, finer level details about how this branching occurs. Uh, if all the branch points are randomly distributed like this, uh, that's one picture, but they could be all on one particular side uh, of the chain to form a comb-like structure. Or in the case of extreme branching, uh, where you have sort of basically one center, uh, the polymer is all branches, uh, and these are kind of star-like uh, configurations. All of these, as you can imagine, have very different properties uh, that may be useful for different kinds of applications. Network polymers uh, are examples of architectures where there's cross-linking or joints that actually form between neighboring polymer chains. Uh, and this is exactly what happened uh, in the vulcanization of rubber. Remember that these polymer chains through chemical reaction then became uh, chemically bonded together uh, to form a network. Now this network could be formed uh, in, by permanent chemical bonds or by temporary interactions. 
uh, and the strength and the density of these crosslinks uh, will dictate uh, the mechanical behavior of the material. If there's a low crosslink density or they're weak crosslinks, then this material can be deformed uh, and can be extended uh, and deformed, like uh, what we think about as rubbers, this rubbery behavior. If there's a high crosslink density, and these are very rigid, rigidly attached. Uh, the material is very rigid, uh, and so that's called a thermoset. Uh, as we'll see later, uh, epoxies are an example of that. So I don't know if you use some of these adhesives, uh, like five-minute epoxy. You have two components, the resin, which is the polymer, and then the crosslinker, which is a crosslinking agent. You mix those together, and then a reaction happens that forms this network, uh, and it's a very rigid network. Uh, it can't be deformed.